it's a whole bunch of one persons that make a difference. If enough individuals do make their small monthly donation, that can make for a sustainable network. Welcome to the next segment of our interview with Suhair Hamad. Suhair is a world-renowned poet from Brooklyn, New York, and star of the new film Salt of the Sea. Suhair, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about how you got into the art of poetry. Oh, uh, I used to love to read as a child. I was real nerdy, and my parents were very strict, so we couldn't go to after-school programs. They had after-school programs in those days. Um, and so I was always reading in the library and at home, and I would you know, finish the book and finish the story in my head. And I think that that's really where my favorite writers, I always research them and, and find that they were voracious readers to begin with. So I, I don't know, I always was attracted to the idea of a story. And then um, my parents taught me that the Quran uh, is divine poetry. And for all of the kind of real life manifestations of religion in people's lives, I was given a sense of that God would give us the word in poetic form. So to have that and hip hop music in the 1980s in Brooklyn, those two things came together, the, you know, the, the secular and the divine, the profane and the sacred. And I, I can't really separate them. Like it was just the fabric of my childhood. And I guess that's where my poetry comes from. First time you went on the Deaf Poetry Slam, you did a poem about 9-11 and how it impacted uh, your, your life and especially Arab Americans living in, in New York. Evident out my window in abstract reality, Sky where once was steel, smoke where once was flesh. Please, God, let it be a mistake, the pilot's heart, the plane's engine. God, please, don't let it be anyone who looks like my brothers. I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the poem and about, about how it has impacted. Wow, I can tell you that I was the last poet to be booked for that show. And um, I think part of the reason was that when they were originally booking the show was the, the show was supposed to be shot the week of September 11th. So they already had, I don't know, 40 or 50 poets from around the country. And they had wanted from me a videotape. And I said, I'm not a performer. I'm a writer. I can send you some poems. I can fax them to you, but I don't audition. Um, and it was very arrogant of me, actually, because the opportunity was so extreme. But I just, I didn't have a tape. So I was like, ah, I guess I'm not doing it. So September 11th happens. Uh, we all deal in the way we deal. By the time they were shooting again, my poem had already been out online. And I had sent the poem originally to 50 people who were my friends. And within a week, it had been translated into at least a dozen languages and had been printed in uh, daily newspapers all around the world. The, the world was really looking towards America for an answer. And a lot of the people of the world were looking towards the Arabs and the Muslims and the others within America for the answers because they had long ago stopped believing um, the official line. So the, the, the poem, which was really personal, it, it, it's all true. My, the towers were outside of my kitchen window. Um, the smoke lasted until December. My brother was in the Navy. It's all true. And you, you kind of think about, like, what's, what's the poem to write that would you know, cover this immense event. And actually, if you write about only what you know, it will translate. And so I wrote really specific, specifically about my experience of that week and that time. And people all over the world related to it because it was the truth as I knew it. In another poem called Mike Check, you talk a, a little bit about the racism um, <clears throat> that has resulted from the war on terror. Mike Check, one, two. Mike Check, my bags at the airport. In a random, routine check, I understand, Mike, I do. You two were altered that day. And most days, most folks operate on fear, often hate. This is my check, your job. And I am always random. I understand. And I was wondering, how has your life changed since the beginning of the war on terror? Well, I had to register with y'all when I came in through Toronto. I was asked if I'd ever been arrested yesterday. And I was given a special, uh, like, I don't know. It wasn't a permit. <laughs> I was given a piece of paper and told to go over there. And then they, they actually like, registered us coming in, which I really didn't expect to happen in Canada. 
actually when I came to Toronto, what I was more concerned about was going back home to Newark Airport and having to explain why I, as a writer, am away for three days and what did I do. And like that's what I experience every time I go back home. Um, having said that, I don't have an accent. I don't cover my hair. And I'm not a man with a beard. So I have a lot more privilege than any of those three categories of people who are all my family and in my family as well. So I would never presume that I can be the face of what Islamophobia and, and hatred of Arabs feels like because the fact that I don't have an accent means that I get to be on American television in a way other people don't. And how do you define terror and terrorism? The um, killing of dreams. <laughs> So a lot of your poetry deals with Palestine and it deals with, <clears throat> sorry, uh, with the war on terror. Um, I was wondering, how is your message received around the world and especially how is it received in Israel and Palestine? It's been, people are so supportive. Mm -hmm. uh, everywhere I've been in the world, I think was, I mean, Jamaica and South Africa really stand out for me as places where people welcomed me as a Palestinian. I mean, South African people said, welcome home. Jamaican people said, you come here <laughs> if you ever need a place to go. So I think uh, for all Americans, actually, not just Palestinians, all Americans would, would benefit from travel. Because I, growing up in New York, had a skewed sense of myself as a Palestinian because I was always on the defensive. Mm -hmm. From my grade school teachers to publishers to, to, to the media, I mean, in any public sphere, I, I felt defensive as a Palestinian. And you, you travel the world, and people are asking me questions about my poetry. You know, people are asking me philosophical ideas of art, you know, and, and the fact that I'm Palestinian doesn't deny my imagination. It doesn't deny, um, you know, my vision. That was, that's the biggest experience that I could talk about, really, of like being kind of feeling uh, attacked all the time in the States or pigeonholed, or the fact that I choose to talk about international relations as though our daily lives were not affected by it. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. If you decide not to talk about politics, that's a political decision you've made. And I respect that decision. Respect mine, you know? So, and women artists, women writers in general have always broken the boundaries of what we can write about, what, what we should write about, what is public and what is personal, and what are like, individual responsibilities and collective. And those are, kinds, those are the things I'm interested in in life, and I try to write through those ideas. Well, in one really transcending poem you wrote, for, uh, you dedicated it for Rachel Corey. It is hard not to hate right now, but I have been loved. I have loved. And I know that those who dehumanize their enemies are only doing so to themselves. And Rachel Corey um, is a world-renowned activist who was killed in Gaza for having stood up for um, a Palestinian doctor whose house was demolished. Um, and considering everything that's going on in Palestine right now as a Palestinian, how do you find an outlet for your rage so that it does not turn into hatred? All you got to do is go to Palestine and meet the people. You want to be inspired about fortitude and patience and forgiveness and humility? Meet those people every day at the checkpoints. Their children are dying because they can't get to the hospitals. They're hated. They're so misunderstood in the whole world. And they don't lose it. I mean, every day that violence does not happen in Palestine is a miracle to me. And the fact that we focus on the people who completely explode in every possible way, that that's our only focus, when every day millions of people make the decision to be nonviolent, that's amazing to me. And when I, you know, when my, butt's, my blood starts to boil and I'm at a fancy wine and cheese reception and someone says something offensive to me, I just think these people choose nonviolence every day. You know, if this is not an opportunity for me to be educated or to educate, I don't have to take this on, you know. But I hope people from Canada do travel to Palestine more and more. I think we just need people there to see it and to make up their own minds. I have friends from every background in the States who've gone, and I'm just happy to talk to people about their experience. I don't need them to have the same one I had. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. And thank you for joining us. Uh, if you enjoyed this coverage, please click on my right for the donate button, and we'll see you soon. Donate today and receive a new documentary film available to members of the Real News Network. The History of the National Security State with legendary author Gore Vidal.
Bonus features of the DVD include an in-depth response to Vidal from ex-CIA analyst Ray McGovern, who served under seven U.S. presidents, an exclusive interview with Colin Powell's former chief of staff Larry Wilkerson, and an insightful interview with oil policy analyst Antonia Juhas. The news magazine of the screen. Living glimpses of history in the making. Hollywood and Washington is a symbiotic relationship. They both deal with illusions. Reality doesn't often uh, play much of a part. I think I saw through the myth of the uh, Cold War almost from the beginning. I was a Washington political kid from a political family. Roosevelt first had radio because he had a, this great speaking voice and everyone liked to hear. Truman proceeded to break every arrangement that Roosevelt had set up for a peaceful coexistence. And Truman thought that it would be a good idea. Why not just stay armed all the time? And then he devised the national security state. You've got to go up and swear allegiance to the United States or else you're a commie. I mean, we, were, we had imported fascism. We get Dwight Eisenhower, who said that we have this great military industrial complex. It is a dangerous thing. And he said, this is going to change everything. And the way our country is governed, it's going to change us politically. Along comes Jack Kennedy, who wanted to make his mark, believed in the Cold War. But he said, in this kind of politics, it is the appearance of things that matters. I think everybody should take a sober look at the world about us. The national security state still exists, only it isn't communism anymore, it's terrorism. This is the most serious thing that has happened in the history of the United States. Knowledge is power. We need an honest new system. We need the real news. This is the sort of thing we can build right now without anyone else's permission from the government or from the business community. It's the powers in our hands. If we're not going to sleepwalk into more wars, we think we need to start with a television news network that won't bow to pressure and has the courage to seek facts. And that means independent economics. And that's why we need you. Make a tax-deductible donation now of at least $10 a month or a one-time give of at least $75. As a thank you for your support, we will send you the new documentary film, The History of the National Security State.